appreciate you taking the time to to share this hour with me talking about migraine. Um, I wanted to talk about the story of a migraine, pretend we're journalists tonight and that we're trying to really understand migraine and break it down so that we can write about it. So I thought we'd we'd talk about it, uh, like a break it down like a journalism, a piece of journalism. We'll talk about who gets migraine, what is migraine, where does migraine occur, is it in the brain or is it in the periphery and try to understand that differential a little bit. When does migraine happen? Why does migraine happen? And perhaps the most important for many of you is how can I treat it? What can I do about it? So let's dive right in. Um, who gets migraine? Migraine, a lot of us do, is the answer to that question. Migraine is the third most common disease in the world. And one in seven people have migraines. And um, for this talk, I actually went searching for a lot of infographics on migraine because I, I like infographics. I think they convey a lot of information uh, graphically. And so I cited them at the bottom, but this is just a resource for you. The American Headache Society has a lot of great resources for migraine um, sufferers, and uh, I would encourage you to take, take a look at it. So one in four homes, there's somebody with migraine. One in five women have migraine. One in 16 men have migraine. One in 11 children have migraine. It is a very common disease. It is more common than heart disease. It is more common than diabetes. Um, and the severity it can, can greatly differ and the frequency can greatly differ from person to person, but it is very common. Who does migraine affect? So 14% of adults, 10% of school age children, 6% of men, but the majority are women. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. If for families, for people with children, if you have migraine disease, your child has a 50% risk of developing migraine too. Um, and so when we look at this slide, just a little deeper dive into women with migraines, since that is the most common uh, uh, group of people who have migraine, oops, excuse me, um, three out of four people with migraine are women. And this is particularly tough for women because migraines usually reach their peak prevalence of women during their 20s and 30s. This is when women are, this is our, you know, when we're having our children, when we're balancing our starting our career and starting our family and have many social obligations. So it's a particularly challenging part of time of life to have a uh, disease that um, usually renders you so functionally disabled. Women are more likely to have um, longer migraine attacks, harder to treat attacks, and um, more, oh, sorry, more migraine related symptoms and higher levels of disability. And, and because migraine is more prevalent in women, some uh, perceive it as a less legitimate disease. And we can have that discussion as well if we want to later on. Where does migraine, uh, where do we get migraine? What happens with migraine? How does it get started? How does it stop? How can we think about the interaction between the brain and the nerves? And this is a really complicated subject, but I, I want to try to, I'm going to try to introduce it a couple different ways over the course of the, of our time together tonight. I think of migraine as a network dysfunction, something there is something that has disrupted the network and, um, and, and has made things go haywire. Migraine is a, uh, also a feedback loop between the central nervous system, so the brain and the neurons, and the peripheral nervous system, which are the nerves that supply sensation to your face and to your muscles and to your hair and to your cervical uh, bones and your vertebrae. And so um, it's, this, it's this feedback loop. What gets it started is um, a whole separate hour that we can talk about, but essentially it probably can start in different places in different people. Some people, it can start 
in the brain. It can start centrally. And some people, it might start due to a lot of input peripherally, a knock on the head, a whiplash accident, um, an injury from, from surgery that can irritate the nerves and really get the nerves firing. The nerves will then in turn, there's my little mouse here, send signal to the brain stem down here where we have the trigeminal. Um, actually, maybe I can annotate this. Mouse. All right. We'll use the we'll use the spotlight. Let's do the spotlight. See if that works. Okay. So we have the trigeminal cervical complex here, which is the brain stem. Signals from the trigeminal ganglion come into the brain stem. They travel up the brain stem into multiple different regions of the brain stem that can cause effects that we'll talk about later on the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and then they come into the brain where they target the neurons and create a lot of hyperexcitability in different parts of the brain, the motor cortex, the sensory cortex, the insula, which controls our emotions, our visual cortex. And, and then in turn, this hyperexcitability causes more vasodilation and more irritation of the dura mater, which causes more excitement of these peripheral nerves. And then the whole cycle continues over and over again. And it usually takes the brain about uh, four to 72 hours before it's able to shut the party down and get the network back online. So uh, hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on in the brain. And um, maybe also why you find, most people find that sleep is very helpful when you get a migraine. I kind of think of it as turning off the computer and allowing the computer to reboot so that things start up um, less excited than they were before. All right, so let's go to the next slide here. So migraine may, some people may just feel migraine in their head. However, migraine can affect virtually every part of your body. And this has to do with the hyperexcitability of the brain. So people can feel pain, not just in their head, um, but they can also get some depression, anxiety, a brain fog, because there's so much hyperexcitability going on. Sometimes they can get um, dizziness and numbness and tingling. They can get sensitivity, not only to light, but to touch, to smell, to taste, to be loud sounds, so all sensory input becomes really exquisitely challenging for the patient and, and painful. Um, and they can get pain not only in the top of their head, but in their nose and in their face and in their ears um, and in their jaw and so and sometimes all over their body. So you can have a lot of different um, problems throughout the body due to migraine. We did a study looking at migraine patients who also have, who come into the chronic pain clinic. So these are patients who have chronic migraine, severe migraine, and we asked them about other pain in their body. And we found that many of them, sorry, that's a bug. <laughs> many of them have um, other types of pain throughout their body. Um, 70, 59% of them, 60% of them had neck pain, 30% of them had upper back pain, and 24% of them had lower back pain. So we see that a lot of them have other pain issues in addition to migraine. Let's move on to when. When do we get migraine? So migraine is actually like a fairly... Um, there's a fairly well-defined cycle, and you may recognize this if you have headache, that is more than just the pain experience itself. It starts out with a prodrome, so that can start days to hours before the headache, and that's the blue area up here in this infographic, and that can be just general sensitivity to light and sound, maybe some nausea, maybe some increased yawning or increased urination, cravings, mood change, neck pain. 
And then many people, maybe up to 30% of people get some sort of aura. It's not always the clearest aura that we um, that we have. It's not always the clear aura that we know, that we think about with the changes in visual light or the spots or the stars. But sometimes it can be numbness and tingling in parts of our body. Sometimes it can be just um, difficulty speaking or understanding others. Um, so sometimes it can be subtle and we don't, um, and maybe even unrecognizable in some people. And then people get a throbbing pain on one side or both sides of their head. And that pain is very, usually very classic. It's worse, worse with movement, there's nausea, there's vomiting, there's sensitivity to light and sensitivity to sound and um, sensitivity to odors. And then you get the postrome, and the postrome is a fatigue, a, a feeling like uh, people describe like being hungover, a feeling of fatigue and weakness and dizziness and lightheadedness uh, that can last for several days afterwards. So just defining the phases of migraine again a little more. Um, and um, uh, the phases start, where well, there's areas of the, um, in the prodrome, you have areas of the brain that are active, including the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and the ventral tegmentum. And this can cause yawning and increased urination and nausea and diarrhea and food cravings. And here's a little graphic showing. It's a, this is a study from uh, 2014 by Mariner, Manier and et al. Um, showing the uh, uh, parts of the brain that have more increased blood flow during this prodromal phase. And um, it does explain some of the reasons. It may explain some of the reasons why we feel this, this unusual symptoms during our prodromal, the prodrome. Then during the aura, you can have visual, sensory, language disturbances. These can last for minutes, between five and 60 minutes. And in a rare, uh, rarely, you can have severe motor deficits. Um, as I said, about... 30, maybe less than 30% of patients, 15 to 30% of patients recognize that they have an aura um, and have a, a, um, an experience in aura. But um, there, there is a concept of maybe there's a silent aura that we all, we all experience when we get migraines, not entirely fleshed out. The next phase is the actual migraine pain. And that's usually a throbbing type of pain. Um, with all of the sensitivities, sensory sensitivities that we uh, talked about. And basically what's happening is that's when the pain receptors, the nociceptors are being activated and it's sending signals to the trigeminal nerve that inner supply sensation to all the structures in your head. And, um, and you're starting to feel that pain that, and that can last for hours. And then when that is over, um, you get the post normal phase of migraine where your, your headache is gone. And sometimes this occurs gradually, but you're, you're not usually completely back to baseline for um, several hours. People can feel weakness, fatigue, impaired concentration, photophobia, um, and and uh, low threshold for moving their head. Sometimes they can't even really move their head very much. So these, these symptoms um, that occur during the prodrome and during the postrome have allowed us to understand that migraine is really an experience of brain dysfunction, of network dysfunction, um, and, and that hopefully will provide us with some ways to target the headache before it gets to be a headache uh, and help the patient transform that head, that um, prodrome and, and, and not let it go into a migraine. So this is a big area of, of research interest. So um, let's move on to why. We'll come back a little bit more and talk about the brain and what's happening in the brain. But what what causes migraine um, and, and why is a big question. And so I, I thought maybe what we'd talk about are two areas of whys, talk about the genetics of migraine and talk about the triggers of migraine. So as I said before, um, if you have um, two parents, if you have 
there, there's a little bit of different data, but in general, if you have migraine, it's about a 50% chance that your child will have migraine. If both parents have migraine, it's a little bit higher. Um, and there are about 30-ish genes that have been defined to, um, to suggest uh, that 30-ish 30th, 30th genes that have been suggested that we know have migraine uh, or, or are found to have found to be part of uh, familial migraine inheritance trees. And these are listed some listing some of them here. Um, the ones in black have been confirmed by other studies, and the ones in gray as of 2020 have 21 haven't been confirmed by other studies. But it would make sense that there's probably lots of different genes that lead to um, creating a genetic vulnerability to migraine. And there are lots of different um, triggers that create a, a vulnerability to migraine. And probably the biggest trigger that you may have heard of are, are hormones. Um, hormones are um, can, can contribute to migraine, we think in both women and men, but it's much more studied in women. And, um, and we've observed this in that most, the most frequent onset of migraine is during menarche. Um, so uh, up until um, menarche, uh, up until a, a woman's first period, boys and girls have headache at the same frequency, have migraine at the same frequency. But after menarche, um, girls have headaches more commonly. Uh, and then that persists through adulthood until menopause. And um, uh, one third of women with migraines say their first attack and their first menstrual period happened around the same time. Um, we think that the menstrual cycle and the changes in estrogen levels that occur with ovulation and with the um, with the bleeding phase are associated with are the most common times that women have headaches. So. So that those are usually the times when women notice that they're going to have uh, a migraine. And this kind of interesting graph here, you can see here that, that migraine with aura, there doesn't seem to be as much of a spike during the middle of the cycle when you have, um, when they have their, uh, um, peer, I think that in this graph, it's supposed to be, this is during the period that, um, when you're having your, your um, migraine without aura many, many, uh, up to 12% of these women with headaches reported a headache around that mid part of their cycle. Um, let's see, what else did I want to cover here? Pregnancy is something that's really commonly discussed and, and um, most women have a fewer, have fewer attacks during pregnancy, usually during Usually that kicks in about the second trimester of pregnancy. And again, that is thought to be due to more stable levels of estrogen throughout the pregnancy. And, um, and the same is with menopause. Two thirds of women have significantly fewer attacks during menopause. And again, that's due to, thought to be due to the lower dose, but lower but stable dose of estrogen. So there's not as much fluctuation perimenopause, so in your you know, late 40s, um, that is a time where there's big swings in estrogen, and that is a time when many women can, can see an uptick in their headaches as they're, as they're going into menopause. Other triggers besides estrogen uh, are things that I think you have probably all experienced. There's an app called Migraine Buddy, and they've come out with these cute infographics about what people have reported to be their most common triggers according to the app. And there are things that I think probably many migraine um, sufferers have experienced. Alcohol, especially red wine, seems to be very, very problematic, and that may be due to the nitrates that are in red wine. Um, caffeine is one that can be problematic in large quantities, although it does seem to be um, okay if, if it's in lower, more stable quantities. Um, 
really intense uh, sensory experiences like bright light or really loud noise or really intense smells can, can trigger headaches. Um, changes in meals like missing meals or not drinking enough water can trigger headaches. Um, weather, barometric changes in weather can trigger headaches. And um, of course, this seems obvious, but uh, stress can, can trigger headaches. And so um, it's not exactly clear what is going on that, that sort of ignites the process. Is it the, um, is it the same reasons that stress interacts with the brain and reasons we don't quite understand yet? Um, is it the change and a migraine, I always tell my migraine patients to just try to keep everything as normal as possible. Don't try to skip a lot of meals or, or do, you know, travel a lot or don't get, you know, get regular sleep, keep everything regular, 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 because that seems like the migraine brain really likes to have seen to, the migraine brain is best optimized with regularity and why that is, we don't exactly know yet. Diet is also something that people say is a huge trigger for them. Um, and it's really hard to know what are the best diets to eat, to, to utilize as a migraine person. Um, I, I meant to put the slide in here about alpha omega-3 and alpha omega-6 fatty acids, which are thought to be um, more alpha omega-3 is thought, uh, like eating a lot of salmon is thought to be very good for migraine patients. Um, other diets that have shown to be successful for migraine patients are elimination diets, ketogenic diets, and low-fat diets. I would say of the three of those, a low-fat diet is probably the easiest, um, and that's kind of the opposite of a ketogenic diet. So maybe different types of diets work for different people, and we don't really understand uh, uh, which, one, which one works for which person yet. There's, there was an interesting study about trying to just give somebody ketones, so not put them into ketosis with a ketogenic diet, not force them to go through the ketogenic diet, but just give them exogenous ketones and see if that helps. Um, and the initial study was not uh, successful, but I think they're trying a different amount of ketones or a different way of giving ketones to see if that's helpful. So stay tuned for that one. Um, a note about how we think about migraines. So just a little side note, we think about migraines as being either low frequency migraines, one to seven days a month, high frequency episodic migraines, eight to 15 days a month, or chronic migraine when you're having more than 15 headache days a month. And that is important for, for treatments and for different studies and just for understanding maybe a little bit more about what's happening in the brain time you're getting to chronic migraine, it's getting harder and harder for the brain to shut the party down, harder and harder for the brain to get control over the abnormal network and abnormal feedback loop that gets going in their brain. Um, and we do know that there are some modifiable risk factors for chronic migraine, and that is um, uh, overuse of acute medication, which is an interesting, um, interesting story, and usually get usually starts with the patient saying, well, I was just taking one Excedrin once a week for that one headache, but then one wasn't working. And so I started taking two and then I needed three and I was taking three twice a week and now I'm taking three, six times a week. And so uh, there's um, one, not a lot, but one nicely done study that does suggest that if you're overusing acute medications, if you're using your acute medications, your rescue medications more than 10 days a month, then you're at risk for overuse headache, which is a, which is a headache on top of a headache um, and may um, decrease the chance that the brain is able to get the headache to settle down on its own. Excessive caffeine consumption. So again, it's never really been studied how much caffeine is okay, but um, too much caffeine consumption is thought to be a, a risk factor for chronic migraine. Snoring or obstructive sleep apnea and obesity are thought to be risk factors for chronic migraine and um, an inadequate acute treatment of migraine. So not having good medications to treat your migraine is thought to be a modifiable risk factor. So those are things that we can do something about. 
Um, things that we can't do anything about are female sex, um, allodynia, which is patients who have a lot of sensitivity to touch, um, seem to be like a touch of the scalp, seem to be a little bit more prone to chronic migraine. Um, head injury is a non-modifiable risk factor, low socioeconomic status, pre-existing depression, anxiety, uh, and other pain disorders are um, um, suggestive that uh, migraine, migraine may become chronic. Um, what do we think happens in chronic migraine that makes it that makes it so chronic? It's not entirely clear, but it may be that there is some iron deposition in the inhibitory pain circuits. So um, there's a loss of balance between excitation and inhibition, uh, allowing for increased excitation and, and not enough inhibition. Um, and there's uh, functional and structural changes in the brain that happen with migraine and, and those changes happen in, in regions that modulate both excitation and inhibition. Um, and there's sensitization of these central neural structures. And, and so, um, so the feedback loop can get to be sort of ingrained in the brain and, um, and the brain forgets how to turn off the feedback loop over time if we just let this cycle run and run and run and we don't do anything about it. So that brings us to how we might intervene. Um, so again, I wanna look at the feedback loop, which is, I appreciate not a complete feedback loop here because we don't totally understand the full complex complexity of the story, but for the sake of this portion of the conversation, we're gonna talk about um, two types of treatment. We're gonna talk about, um, where's my spotlight? We're going to talk about modulating the periphery, so medications and treatments that act on the peripheral nervous system, and that would be the trigeminal nerves um, out on the skin um, that don't they don't cross the blood brain barrier, they don't go into the central nervous system, and then we have the the centrally modulating medications that act on the brain to quiet down neuro neurons, which are the neuro neuronal cells in the brain, and quiet those, quiet down those, and stop those cells from firing. So, um, to be uh, in a, in the best case scenario, we would want to choose both a centrally modulating medication and a peripherally modulating medication, um, and and centrally modulating medications are the medications that you guys have heard about over the years. They're the Topamax and the Depakote and the Amitriptyline and the Propranolol. All of these medications um, cross the blood-brain barrier and act in the central nervous system to help calm down neuronal firing. And um, because they cross the blood-brain barrier, they make you tired and they make you sometimes feel a little out of it and sometimes a little dizzy. Um, and, and sometimes a little nauseous, and um, and they're hard to tolerate, uh, quite frankly. And so many people don't want to take them. Um, and so we've seen a new age of the development of peripheral treatments, and we're going to talk about those a little bit right now. Um, oh yeah, I'm gonna before I get there, I'm gonna talk about um, herbs and vitamin supplements um, because there's always a lot of questions about that and. Um, uh, there's a couple different, there's the ones that I listed here are the ones that we recommend most commonly. Um, I will just put a note of um, caution on here. I cannot tell you if when you go to Walgreens and you pick up some riboflavin, if you're taking actual riboflavin or if you're eating dirt, because there's no regulation of vitamins and supplements in the, in the United States. So um, I would encourage you to look on sites like, um, oh boy, I'm blanking on them. There, there are sites like, cons like Consumer Reports, but for vitamins um, and, and supplements that test them out and validate them and will tell you which brands are better than others. Um, Kirkland, the Costco brand is actually usually a fairly reputable brand. Um, I'm just saying that off the top of my head because I can't remember all of them right now, but there are, um, that is something to consider and look into if you are into or want to try herbs and vitamin supplements. Um, 
Riboflavin and coenzyme Q10 are medications that uh, we think help modulate mitochondrial regulation. And that is um, a piece of the hyperexcitability puzzle. Um, could the brain be getting um, more easily excited uh, and, and triggered more easily due to some sort of mitochondrial or some sort of energy dysfunction or aberration? And so um, it has been noted by, you know, by some studies, mostly done out of Germany, that these um, mitochondrial um, regulators can, can be helpful. Magnesium is a glutamate regulator. So in neuronal hyperexcitability, we see up regulation of glutamate, which is a, a excitatory neurotransmitter. And magnesium seems to help calm that down again. Um, there, are, there are more bioavailable forms and less bioavailable forms. Um, citrate and oxide are some of the more bioavailable formulations of magnesium. Sulfate is not a very a very um, uh, good uh, bioavailable formulation um, of magnesium. Feverfew is thought to inhibit serotonin and prostaglandins in the brain, and, um, and that may help with a not making the brain as easily uh, as vulnerable to migraine and melatonin can help regulate sleep and um, that can be very important for migraine patients to make sure that they get regular and, and good sleep and there is a nice study by Amy Gelfand looking at children and melatonin and migraine. Um, but the new, the newest kids on the block are uh, CGRP modulators and um, hopefully if you if you have have migraine or have heard have loved ones with migraine, you probably have heard about these medications. Um, calcitonin gene related peptide is a big word, so we uh, we shorten it. We call it CGRP, and it is a primary component of the neuroinflammatory cascade. What is the neuroinflammatory cascade? We think it's a um, it's a cascade that happens when a nerve gets excited and it, it, it perpetuates the excitation of the nerve. So it keeps the nerve excited. It keeps the nerve firing and it induces the nerve to, uh, to say, hey, to, to fire so much that its neighbors get excited as well and start to fire as well. We call that peripheral sensitization. And it, it seems like it is the uh, trigeminal nerve that is um, mainly where CGRP is located. There might be CGRP in other nerves, but it seems like it's most predominant in the trigeminal nerve. Um, and it seems that it can trigger, in, in studies, it can trigger migraine-like attacks in patients versus, versus, but does not trigger migraine attacks in healthy controls. It does seem like the CGRP levels are elevated in your serum and your blood during attacks and decreased CGRP in plasma um, correlates with decreased pain after a patient's given sumatriptan. So um, those initial studies led to the development of these medications called CGRP uh, targeted therapies. And um, the first ones on the market were monoclonal antibodies. So these are um, injections, uh, the, the three on the left here, um, arenumab, galconazumab, and fremonazumab are all subcutaneous injections, whereas eptonazumab is an IV, an IV formulation. But these are antibodies that um, bind to the CGRP uh, in your body and take it out of commission so that it's not available to perpetuate uh, this neuroinflammatory cascade. And um, because these are peripherally acting drugs, because they do not cross the blood-brain barrier in high concentrations, um, they have very few side effects. Uh, they're metabolized by the reticular endothelial system, so they're not metabolized by the liver or the kidney. Um, and they also have a really, excuse me, my spot's a bit messy. They also have a really long half-life. So you can have monthly dosing or quarterly dosing, which for most people, is desirable. They don't have to take a pill every day. But if you don't want to do an auto injector, you're planning on getting pregnant, or um, 
you're worried about how having a drug in your body for that long, or you're worried about a side effect, or you're scared of needles, there are oral medications as well. Um, so this is just a little bit more of the details of the medications. Um, they have, a, so we'll go to the orals in a second, but these uh, medications have a very nice, uh, what we call a 50% responder rate. So that's how we look at a drug in the headache world and um, decide if it's effective or not. We say, does it help 50% of the people 50% of the time? And we call that the 50% responder rate. And um, most of these studies uh, showed that like galcanizumab, 60% of their patients had a 50% response. Eptanizumab, about the same. Freminizumab, about the same. So um, most of them had a 50% responder rate. And interestingly, um, they looked at, at the 100, some of the studies looked at the 100% responder rate. And in this um, galcanizumab study, 11 0.5% of the patients that they gave this medication to responded completely, had no headaches, nothing. So that's kind of interesting. Um, let's go on. I'm going to talk about, actually, um, I'm just going to go and come back to that for one second. We're going to go to the other CGRP um, uh, oral antagonists since we're talking about those. So the other CGRP, the other way of using a CGRP medication is to take it orally. And these are called receptor antagonists. And there's there's two, this Ubrojapan um, is called Ubrel-V and it was developed for a rescue medication. And it was designed to be very similar to a triptan. So you take it um, at, as needed when the headache starts to come on and then you can repeat it after two hours after the initial dose. Um, and um, it's a very a peak plasma. So it takes about uh, half, an hour, hour and a half to kick in and the half life is five to seven hours. Um, and and um, it has fewer side effects than most rescue medications. Um, at least most triptans, most common side effects are similar to, um, most common side effect was nausea and fatigue was the second most common side effect. The sister drug to Ubrojapan is called Remigipan and that's Nurtec. And Nurtec is, was originally designed as a rescue medication, um, but it has since gotten, um, uh, FDA approval as a preventive medication. So you can either take it, um, uh, you know, when you get a headache, or you can take it every other day as a preventive medication. And then the final g -pant that's on the market that I actually don't have a slide for is called a toe pant and that's q -lipta, And that's a daily preventive medication. So the main side effects of all the CGRPs are that um, they can cause a little bit of um, GI upsetness. And that can be nausea, stomach ache, um, sometimes constipation. And that's because there is some CGRP in the gut. And so that's probably the binding of the CGRP in the gut is probably causing those symptoms. Um, sometimes you can have an allergic reaction to the injection. It's usually a, a skin reaction, a cutaneous reaction. Um, uh, but I haven't had a lot of bad side effects from these medications. Again, I think mainly that's because they're peripherally acting and not centrally acting. Um, so the other, so, so we talked about the CGRPs and I want to, I just want to go back and, um, talk about the, triptans, because I don't want us to forget about the triptans. And I think that um, triptans, you may have all tried them in the past, or maybe you haven't. Maybe your doctor just skipped right over to give you the newer medications. But these medications are um, highly selective serotonin 1B and 1D receptor agonists that are located in the periphery, so target the peripheral neurons. Um, some of the tryptans can cross the blood-brain barrier and bind to the rostral brainstem and the thalamus, but not all of them. Um, 
and uh, they are um, uh, they're very good medications. When they did a large study, a large review, and um, meta analysis looking at 133 randomized controlled trials, they found that um, the standard dose of tryptans relieved headaches for patients within two hours, uh, you know, between in 42 to 76 percent of the patients. So, um, so that's still very good data. So it's not always that that newer is better. Um, the medications that we have are still very good. And we have a lot of variety of triptans. We have triptans in um, nasal sprays. We have triptans in subcutaneous injections. We have triptans in suppositories even, um, oral dissolving triptans. So there's a lot of variety. Um, uh, and they also have short hat onsets. So like they come on quickly, like a nasal spray will, will um, kick in in about 10 minutes. An injectable can kick in in about six minutes. Um, and some of them are short acting, like a sum sumatriptan lasts, the half-life is two and a half hours out of your system versus Frova where it, it's about a 24 hour, 25 hour half-life. So it stays in your system for a much longer period of time. So for people that have headaches that last several days, a longer acting triptan might be a better option than a shorter acting triptan. Um, let's see here. I'm just going to okay, so skip over a few of these. I want to introduce one of the newer medications here also that I didn't talk about called lesmitidan, and that's a 5-HT1F receptor agonist. It's also indicated for, uh, for rescue, um, but it does cause ca cross the blood brain barrier and can cause some impairment and, um, sleepiness and dizziness and sedation. Um, and, uh, uh, there's a warning that says that you're not supposed to drive within eight hours after taking this medication. But for some people, it really, really works incredibly well. Okay. So there are also procedures that we do for migraine, and um, we can talk about occipital nerve blocks. Um, we can talk about intranasal sphenopalatine blocks. These are usually good, good blocks for people who have um, had their migraines are getting like a little more heated up. So they were maybe having migraines once a week and now they're having migraines five days a week and they can't seem to break the cycle and they can't seem to slow things down. Or maybe they've had a migraine for like seven days and they can't seem to get it to break. That's what these procedures are the best for. Um, Botox is a procedure that is commonly used for prevention. And um, that can be used for patients with chronic migraine with headaches more than um, 15 days a month. And the data shows that getting 155 units to 195 units injected in these spots every 12 weeks can decrease your rate of migraines by 50% in about 50% of, of people. Um, the other Thing I wanted to share with you is this whole new world of non-invasive neuromodulation. Um, and it seems like every day there's a new device that's coming out on the market um, that will allow you to um, calm, either calm down or quiet down some of the nerve signals that are, um, are traveling into your trigeminal nerve or in the case of this one on the right here, this vagal nerve uh, stimulator, uh, gamma core, this works by modulating your autonomic nervous system, your vagus nerve. Um, this one, cephaly, works by modulating your supraorbital nerve, and relivion modulates your supraorbital and your occipital nerve in the back of your head. Um, this is a eNeura is a handheld um, device, handheld magnet. It's a half Tesla magnet that helps um, sort of realign the neurons and see if we can help the neurons calm down that way. And then we have the only uh, device that's approved for children um, is the Nerivio, and that's a remote um electrical neuromodulator, you put it on your arm and you hook it up to your phone. And uh, the idea is that it induces inhibition. So the way it works is that you look 
you're, you turn up the volume on that remote electrical neuromodulator to us get a sensation of annoyance, maybe not pain, but annoyance. And your brain has to pay attention to that sensation. And when your brain realizes that that sensation is not dangerous, only annoying, it will try to inhibit that sensation because it's an un, it's unimportant incoming stimuli that the brain doesn't need. So it encourages the brain to kick into inhib inhibitory modes and to um, hopefully decrease excitatory um, networks. And, and then, so, so those are interesting modes that we can certainly talk about. I think that the, the take home here, I want you to take home is that insurance covers none of these. The data on them is mostly done by the companies, but, um, but for some people, they are really effective. And for people who really want to try non-pharmacologic strategies, you know, they, these are not going to harm you in any way. Um, and, uh, and other than your pocketbook, that's really the only way they're going to harm. And they might hurt. They might help. <laughs> Not hurt. They might help. Um, okay. And I think I have one more slide. Um, and my last slide here is just um, if you Google sort of the, the multiple things that are out there for migraine, you will come across many, many things. Um, some of the things that my patients have shared with me over the years and that I've heard from other colleagues include the ice cap. So buying a, an ice cap or an ice um, hat or eye covers that you keep in your freezer. Um, red tented lenses uh, are helpful for some people. This, uh, and this is from a company called Therospecs. Um, this is the Allay lamp, which is a green light lamp. And this is based on some research showing that migraine patients prefer this light. It's the least excitatory for, for their brain. Um, this is a device that's like an inner, an, you put it in your ear and they claim to help migraines. It's called Zoc. I have not tried it yet, but I'm curious and I might order it just to, just to see. Um, these are some online tests for food sensitivity in California. It's very hard to find an allergist who will test you for, for food sensitivity um, and food allergies. And so if you want to do it yourself, um, I've heard mixed, I've, I've heard mixed things about the results of these, of these tests, but some people might, might find that interesting to explore. Again, these are home tests. You open it, you take it home, you do the kit, you send it back in. Um, and, and this is a, an app. Um, this is one that I actually will say I think is very, is the most cool, the one I'm most excited about. And these are, this is a, the beginning, I hope, of more um, short cognitive strategies for helping people learn to modulate their brain, to get into inhibition, to get out of to, to decrease their neuronal excitation to the extent that they can. Obviously, we, we don't have full control over our, all the excitability in our brain, but we can learn um, uh, you know, graded motor imagery. We can learn breathing techniques. We can learn um, mindfulness techniques that can help calm down some of the... Um, uh, the fear, the catastrophizing, the anxiety surrounding the pain experience that heightens and worsens the pain experience. And so um, Curable is one app. There's many on the market, but um, I think something like this can be very, very helpful for uh, support and, um, and um, more to providing more tools in your toolbox for migraine. All right, so I'm going to stop here. I... Um, I don't know if I covered everybody. We, we got a lot of questions before the session. Um, and if I didn't cover your question, then go ahead and write it in the Q&A now and I'll just start tackling this. And if we need to stay a few minutes after, I'm happy to do so. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, so the first question um, says that, um, my husband had migraines in high school through his 30s. They resumed at age 68, and, and he is now having two to four a month. 
He has an aura followed by a headache, no severe symptoms. He treats them with Celebrex and Pepsid. Um, uh, we haven't been able to find a cause. Should we just stop worrying about these migraines? I think this is a really interesting area that we need to think a lot about. So when you have a, a history of migraines, you could always develop migraines later on in life, and that's not uncommon. But when you have an aura, we do worry about some um, vascular etiology. So um, I would make sure that you uh, re-image uh, to make sure that there's no um, signs of stroke. And um, many patients, um, migraine with aura is considered to be an independent stroke risk factor. So I would make sure that all your other stroke risk factors are modified, treating high blood pressure, treating high cholesterol, treating diabetes, not smoking. Um, if you're on any estrogen, you would need to stop that. And, um, and then I would consider taking a baby aspirin uh, daily. So um, I'll leave it at that. And Celebrex and Pepsid to treat it is probably uh, not a terrible thing for two to four times a month. Um, I think if they got more frequent, then you may want to talk to your doctor about some different strategies for, for um, rescue. Is there a difference between, next question, is there a difference between headache and migraine? I get headaches often, and I only tend to call one a migraine if I'm completely incapacitated. This is a really good question. And in, it, it, uh, they, as headache, as migraine doctors, as headache doctors, we frequently call it a headache because it is the most, migraine is the most common type of headache. And very, very often you will talk to a migraine patient who has different severity of their headache. At the far end, they will get a migraine that is incapacitating as this person says, but on the other end of the spectrum, they'll get less severe headaches. And um, I count them all as headache days. And I use that to try to determine how I'm going to uh, target my prophylaxis or my preventive regimen. And I also want to make sure that the patient's not overusing rescue medication because um, if they're taking rescue for, if they're only telling me they have one migraine a month, I, I'm not worried about it. But if I find out that they have 20 other headaches a month that they're treating with just an Advil and then this one migraine a month, then we're probably getting into a medication overuse scenario where we need to augment the, um, augment the preventive strategies. Um, so yes, I think you could call them all migraines and um, of some variation or headaches of some variation. And, um, and they're kind of under the same umbrella and the treatment approach is basically the same. Um, many doctors, uh, in my experience, say the cause of migraine is not important for treatment. Is this true? I, I think that's a really interesting question. So migraine is really what we call a phenotype. Migraine is an expression. So I, when you tell me how you're feeling, I'm, I'm hearing the symptoms of what you're saying and I'm putting the picture together and I'm getting this picture of somebody who has migraine. But why somebody has migraine is really varied. And we touched on some of the issues tonight, um, but sometimes we don't, we don't understand it. Sometimes we don't know what's going on. And so I, I don't, I think the treatment pathways are still the same. But it is important to explore the reasons why the patient's getting headaches. And maybe they do have a genetic predisposition, but maybe they're also like drinking 20 cups of coffee a day. And if we could just, you know, talk, explore the triggers a little bit, maybe we could decrease the frequency and the severity of the headaches. Um, okay. Is there any established relationship between migraine? idiopathic intracranial hypertension or migraine and POTS. Um, it's, I think it's sort of the same idea that I was just saying. Migraine is a phenotype. Migraine is a very common picture of uh, a very common presentation of a headache. And there are different reasons why patients have those headaches. I will usually find that my patients with hypertension or low pressure in their brain or high pressure in their brain or POTS, um, don't seem to have quite the same degree of light sensitivity and sound sensitivity 
um, and nausea that the mites, well, maybe they get not nausea, but um, not light and sound sensitivity that the migraine patients get. Um, the uh, POTS patients also get this really predominant, like coat, we call it a coat hanger headache, which is mostly in the back of the neck and spreading out along the scapula. That's much more common, um, but they can get both. They can get their pressure headache and their migraine. So that you can have you can have more than one type of headache. Um, another good question: Would CGRPs be safe in pregnancy or conception? Um, and the answer is we don't know. Um, and so I would not recommend it. So I don't recommend um, CGRP. Uh, injectables if you're trying to get pregnant i would want you off of those for six months um, prior to conception and the oral cgrps i would want you off of those like as soon as you knew that you had conceived or as soon as you you know decided to start trying um correct topamax is not um and um, um beta blockers calcium channel blockers can sometimes be okay during pregnancy um, it's a really a discussion that you want, you want to have with your doctor and um, maybe your OB prior to your pregnancy, um, prior to conception, if possible. Okay. Um, uh, this is a question about uh, what my significant other developed changes in the in her menstrual cycle after using a uh, subcutaneous anti CGRP injection and it caused her to stop using the drug after stopping her cycles normalized. Um, it, do you have any anecdotal testimony from patients who you've seen have developed this? Uh, no, that's the first time that I've ever heard that. So. Um, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how to explain that, but um, I think that's interesting, and I will I will ask my patients about that. Thank you for that um, that comment. Um, okay, another patient asks about um, uh, glasses. Are the glasses? I see a few different colors of glasses online, and I wonder which is best. It's uh, we used to think that this red tinted glass, which is called Oxblood was the best for migraine patients. Um, but then um, Rami Burstein, who's a uh, researcher in Boston, um, actually did a really cool study where he um, used different wavelengths of light on migraine patients, some of whom were blind, and, um, and shine the, the migraine, the light into their, um, you know, into their eyes, even though they're blind. And um, most of the patients responded like they're, they felt less pain with the green light. Um, and I think there was some sort of neuro, maybe imaging correlation of that study as well that showed that it was it was just less hyper excitable, that green light. So I don't know, I guess I would kind of try what might work better for you. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, a good definitive answer for that. Okay, well, it's eight o'clock. I feel like I made it through most of all the questions. Um, I do want, there's one more question I wanted to see here. I wanted to say here, um, I get, this patient says, I get migraines at about 3 a.m. What could be causing these? Interestingly, that is one of the, the most common times when people get migraines. So it's not unusual, but a couple things we do want to make sure we check on. We want to make sure you don't have sleep apnea. If you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain during that time of night, then that could be causing a headache. Um, and the other thing is that clenching can certainly cause a headache or contribute to a headache. And um, uh, that that is a problem. The way that we recommend dealing with that is a little bit complicated. So sometimes patients find that mouth guards help, um, but the mouth guard doesn't stop the clenching. Um, Botox to the masseters and the temporalis actually inhibits those muscles from contracting so that you can't, you can't clench. Um, and so that's probably the best uh, strategy. There's also a lot of great 
jaw relaxation exercises on online and doing those regularly throughout the day may help decrease some of the tension in your muscles. Um, it might not get you from involuntary contractions at night, but it, it might help um, during the rest of the day and might help you um, figure out other ways to address your stress because oftentimes, the, oftentimes clenching is um, due, to, due to stress and, and anxiety. Thank you, Dr. Braun. You are Thank very you. welcome. Thank, Thank you guys you. for attending. It was, it was a good session and I um, hope to, uh, to do it again. Yeah, thank you for sharing all this great information. I just want to thank our audience for joining us tonight and for all of your questions. If you like additional information or any research, please contact Stanford Health Library, and we hope you'll join us for our next lecture. Bye, everybody. Have a good night.